This video is brought to you by my kind supporters on Patreon. If you enjoy my content, go check it out by clicking on the link in the description. By becoming a patron, you will get access to additional content, early access to videos, work in process updates, and more. Military leadership is one of the most crucial components to winning wars. Generals lead their armies and make decisions that can make or break their nation's success. Some generals are exceptional, others not so much. Often, military talent is a complicated subject. Flavius Belisarius was a general of the Eastern Roman Empire in the decades following the fall of Rome. His story is a fascinating part of a dark time of uncertainty, betrayals, wars, and plagues. Although his generalship can be likened to that of other great Roman generals, his name is sadly not as well known. So what was it that made Belisarius such a fantastic military commander? What were the qualities of generalship he held that gave him an edge on the competition? Today, we'll explore together. Think of where you were or will be at age 28. Most of you would probably say starting a family, working a job, kicking it in prison, or living in your mom's basement. Figures. In 528 CE, one Roman 28-year-old named Flavius Belisarius was having the time of his life. And by that, I mean he was in charge of an entire war, leading a bunch of raw recruits, and going up against an army who had an elite band of troops called the Immortals. Maybe your desk job isn't so bad after all. But Belisarius wouldn't have it any other way. He was an ambitious, talented officer who at a young age had a lot to prove. This was his moment. So how was it then that Belisarius ended up in this situation, and what did he do? Well, that's exactly what we're going to explore. In the 6th century CE, two superpowers dominated the Near East, the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire, and the Sassanid Persians. Sometimes, these two powers would come to blows, sending armies against each other and engaging in massive battles. Most of the time, however, conditions were peaceful. Peace being a relative term. The two empires would not battle each other directly, but sought to establish spheres of influence over neighboring minor states in Arabia and the Caucasus. Through them, they would engage in proxy conflicts. In the 520s, relations had again broken down between the two giants and direct conflict was back on the menu. First, diplomatic communications were severed after things went awry during a potential adoption deal when Byzantine Emperor Justin I insulted Persian King Kavad. Later, the Persians got into a scrap with their client state Iberia. We no, not that Iberia. This one. Confused? Me too. Anyways, as it turns out, religion was the root of the conflict. Simply put, the Iberians were Christian and the Persians were not. The Persian king demanded Iberia begin adhering to their customs, which the Iberians did not take kindly to. Imagine that. Iberia defected to the Romans, and the Persian king had something to say about that, so he sent his forces to retake Iberia by force. The Romans responded, and the powers of the Near East in 526 CE had yet again found themselves at war. The first year did not go well for the Byzantines. Emperor Justin had died, leaving his nephew Justinian in charge, and the Iberians completely folded. There was a real danger the conflict would spill out into new areas. Namely, much of the remaining drama would occur between two fortresses situated across the border, Dara and Nisibis. Nisibis had previously been a fortress of crucial strategic value for Rome, but they had lost it to Persia in a previous war. Still needing a strong fortress in the area, the Romans built Dara just a couple dozen miles down the road. After coming to power, Justinian wanted to better defend the empire from the threat of Persian invasion. He had met Belisarius previously and recognized great potential in him, so he appointed him commander of Dara. His first task was to construct a new fortress at a place called Tanaris. The Persians noticed the construction and began sending threats to Belisarius. They knew allowing the Romans to build a new fortress would be a huge blunder. After making no headway, they sent in their army. Belisarius was reinforced by two other senior commanders and they prepared for battle. The Romans lost badly, with several of their commanders killed or captured. They were forced to retreat to Dara and the Persians destroyed their construction. Belisarius' first real action had been a defeat. Luckily, he was outranked by the other two commanders, and as such was able to avoid much of the blame of this loss. Still in good favor with Justinian, he was even promoted to senior command. 
Indara, around a year later, talks of peace abound. Justinian had dispatched diplomats to facilitate peace talks, and they were currently awaiting an answer from the Persians to begin negotiations. Suddenly, reports came in that the Persians had instead sent an army to capture Dara. The Persian forces consisted of around 40,000 well-trained men, many of which were heavy cavalry. With them were the elite Persian cataphracts called the Immortals. As their cool name implies, these guys were the best of the best. Belisarius was in command of a much smaller force of around 25,000. To make matters worse, many of these guys were untrained and inexperienced infantry. They were so hastily recruited that in order to get some help out of them, Belisarius had to train them in archery at the last minute. Many of them had never even touched a bow. Still, Belisarius had large contingents of heavy cavalry available who were tough fighters in their own right. He also had his own crack units, his elite personal guard, the Bucalarii, and a few small contingents of allied Hunnic and Harul cavalry, barbarians who Belisarius would continue to use throughout his career. While Persia marched, Belisarius considered his options. Sure, they could pull back behind the safety of the walls of Dara, but then they would have to be under siege, and they wouldn't be able to get any food in, and just, eh. Belisarius really wasn't about that life. And who can blame him for not wanting to starve for months inside a tiny fort? Instead, Belisarius brought his army out in front of the walls and made preparations for a pitched battle. He knew his troops were outnumbered and outmatched, but that just meant he had to get creative. He ordered his troops to begin digging a system of trenches wide enough that a horse couldn't jump over them and close enough to the walls for archers to provide support. At certain points, he left breaks in the trench that acted as choke points for the Persian cavalry to funnel into. The wings of the trench were forward, while the center was further back, making any enemy attacking the center easy to flank. The trench works mitigated the impacts of a full-on Persian cavalry charge and gave Belisarius a significant defensive advantage. Not long after, the Persian army arrived. They made camp just a few miles down the road and began to array themselves for battle. They placed their cavalry in front and their infantry in the back. Belisarius placed his weak infantry behind the center trench and his cavalry behind both wings. On the interior were the contingents of Hunnic cavalry to provide support. Belisarius himself was positioned with his Bucalarii behind the center where he could observe the battlefield best. The Persians began with a cavalry attack against the Byzantine left. Overwhelmed, the Byzantines began to fall back, but the Persian cavalry paused, feeling threatened by the Huns in the center. This gave the Byzantine left time to rally and counterattack, forcing the Persians to retreat. Once back, a young Persian soldier rode out in front of the Byzantine lines, taunting them and demanding individual combat. The call was answered by a wrestling coach named Andreas. The two men charged. The Persian was good, but Andreas was better. He struck the Persian with his lance, dismounted, and finished him off in a flash. The Roman troops cheered and celebrated. Angrily, another Persian rode out to demand single combat. Andreas again, in spite of having been forbid to do so, rode out to meet the challenger. This time, both men missed each other, their horses crashing into each other and everyone falling down. The dazed Persian began to rise. Too slow, Andreas was already on his feet and struck the Persian down. A deafening roar emanated from the Roman lines. The soldiers were ecstatic. In their humiliation, the Persians were done for the day. The following morning, an additional 10,000 Persian troops arrived from Nisibis, further stretching the Persian advantage. Belisarius sent a letter trying to reason with the Persian commander. Peace is a blessing, as is agreed by all reasonable men. If one should destroy the peace, he is most responsible for the troubles to come. We have made it clear we desire peace, and urge you do not destroy this, lest you be held responsible by the powers that be in Persia. The Persian commander arrogantly responded. Wise words, were they not coming from a fickle and untrustworthy Roman? Prepare yourselves for battle, and tomorrow, make sure you ready my bath and lunch before I arrive in the city. Hubris. The following day, the Persian commander launched his attack around noon, just before the Romans ate their first meal. The battle began with the two sides barraging each other with arrows. The Persian archers were better and more numerous, but a strong and steady wind was coming from behind the Romans, limiting their casualties. After the barrage had ended, the Persians launched their attack. They split up their cavalry into two groups which would simultaneously engage the Roman left and right. On the left, 
Belisarius' trenches had worked wonders to stop the Persian charge outright, but as the Persians began pushing their way across the gaps, the Romans began to lose more and more ground. But Belisarius had a trick up his sleeve. He had placed the contingent of Harul cavalrymen behind a nearby hill out of sight of the Persians. As soon as they had crossed the trench, the Haruls charged down. At the same time, the nearby Huns wheeled and charged across their bridge into the Persian lines. They were being flanked from both directions. The Persians were now being pushed into each other, being cut down left and right. Panic began to set in, and the Persian horsemen fled the scene in fear. On the Roman right, the Persian attack had limited success. After taking a moment to regroup, the Persian commander decided to fully commit to breaking this side. With his remaining heavy cavalry, including his cracked squadrons of immortals, he launched a staggering attack on the Roman right. The overwhelmed Byzantines could not keep up with this for long and began to falter. From his central position, Belisarius saw their movements and ordered reinforcements from the left to attack, and to great effect. The Persian back line had become bogged down in the fighting, and the first line continued chasing the retreating Romans. Belisarius then ordered his elite Bucalarii to split the two and engage the Persian first line from behind. Realizing reinforcements were here, the Roman right rallied and charged back into the Persian line as well, a devastating encirclement. Just as before, panic had set in, and the Persians were pressed up against one another like sardines. Eventually, the Persian second-in-command was slain, and the line broke. The Persian infantry, now on an island, began to panic and rout as well as their defeated cavalry scattered. The Byzantines gave chase for a couple miles before Belisarius called them off, fearing the Persians would rally and destroy the disorganized Roman forces. The battle had been won, and the Persian invasion of Roman lands foiled. The war continued for some time, and Belisarius would get one more chance to display his skills as a general. He lost, mainly due to his inability to control his junior commanders, one of his few deficiencies as a general that would plague his entire career, but his efforts prevented the Persians from continuing their campaign. The Battle of Dara was the first example of Belisarius' shining star. He proved himself at a young age to have a robust and imaginative understanding of tactical defensive concepts, primarily depicted with his use of the trenches and pre-battle deployment. More so, he proved to have a dynamic grasp of tactical offensive concepts as well, ordering timely and swift counterattacks during the Persian charge on the right flank. As he transitioned to pursuit, he remained cautious and did not allow his troops to overextend themselves. His use of terrain was excellent. He dictated to the Persians where the battle would be fought and held terrain that was necessary for them to take. He forced them to attack over difficult obstacles which limited their avenues of approach. He made excellent use of the terrain to provide concealment from which he could surprise the enemy. Finally, he positioned himself and his army in a place where they could easily observe the enemy and react quickly to their movements. While the Persians were for sure overconfident, they were the real deal. Their troops were elite and heavily outnumbered the Romans. Their commander's decision to attack the Romans before they ate their first meal proved that they had not abandoned measured strategic thinking. Belisarius earned this victory, and it proved to be their first battlefield victory over the Persians in over 150 years. At the onset of the year 533 CE, Justinian had been Byzantine Emperor for close to six years. In that time, he had completely reformed the Byzantine Empire, secured his eastern border by striking a peace deal with Persia, and violently quashed a major revolt that had risen in Constantinople. With his rule secure, he was now well situated to pursue his ambitions, the restoration of the Roman Empire. His first target, the Vandalic Kingdom of North Africa. But before he began, he needed one thing a casus belli. Even back then, people still considered it important to have a casus belli or justification for war. You can't just go off conquering people, you have to make sure there's a flimsy pretext in place first. So that's exactly what Justinian started looking for.
The Vandals snatched North Africa from the Romans in 439, about four decades before the collapse of the Western Empire. As groups like the Vandals, Goths, and Franks began establishing themselves in Roman territory, most continued Roman institutions and traditions, at least nominally. Not the Vandals. They established their own government, distinguished themselves from the Romans with their Germanic language and clothing, and practiced a different brand of Christianity than the native population who they actively persecuted. North Africa had been a part of Rome for centuries, and the population there still considered themselves Romans. Needless to say, they were constantly at odds with the Vandal ruling class. The Vandals were also at odds with the Empire. Over the 5th century, the Vandals had constantly raided the Italian coasts of the Western Empire. They had even sacked the city of Rome in 455. Even after the fall of the West, relations between the Vandals and the Eastern Empire were tense. Luckily for the Byzantines, in 523 a pro-Roman prince named Hilderic ascended to the Vandal throne and the next few years saw the greatest Roman-Vandal relations of all time. He was so pro-Roman that Justinian had hoped to peacefully integrate North Africa back into the Roman fold. However, the Vandal elites were less enthusiastic about this, and in 530, Justinian's hopes were dashed when Hilderic's rival Gelimer carried out a coup. Hilderic was imprisoned, and the Roman persecution resumed. With Gelimer in charge, his rule proved to be factious and divisive. Some of the Vandal elite did not recognize his rule as legitimate, and much of the native Romans were resistant to Vandal rule. It all came to a head when both of these factions rebelled in 533, which Justinian maybe had a hand in. Civil disorder broke out in Sardinia and Tripolitania. Leaders of both factions immediately petitioned Justinian to intervene, to which Justinian was like, oh, you want me to help restore the pro-Roman guy to the throne? Well, if you insist. And so he began preparations for an invasion. He sent officers to help coordinate the rebels and appointed General Belisarius to the head of an expeditionary force. Belisarius proved himself an excellent commander in the war against Persia and a trustworthy ally during the Great Riots, so he was an obvious choice. And so it was that as Justinian successfully divided the Vandals, Belisarius began his mission of reconquest. After mustering his forces in Constantinople, Belisarius departed for North Africa at the head of an army of around 15,000, a small but highly capable force. On the way, the expedition faced a number of setbacks which nearly doomed the voyage. Namely, the supplies were improperly prepared and became moldy, causing many soldiers to fall ill. Belisarius planned out a number of stops along the way at which they could get fresh supplies. His decisive action here enabled his army to land healthy and strong, rather than sick and weak. Advantage? Check. Later, they reached Sicily where Belisarius received fantastic news. Gelimer had sent his brother, a good chunk of his army, and almost his entire navy to put down the rebellion in Sardinia. This presented Belisarius with an incredible opportunity. The Vandal army, while large, was inexperienced and poorly led. Even though Belisarius had a much smaller force, he felt comfortable duking it out on the ground with them. On the other hand, the Vandals' greatest asset was their navy, which was the largest and most powerful in the Mediterranean. The fact that they were off messing around in Sardinia was a dream come true. Almost unanimously, Belisarius' generals urged him to attack the Vandal capital of Carthage. It made sense, but doing so would put them just close enough to the Vandal fleet's area of operations. He didn't want any surprises, so he instead chose to land a ways down the coast from Carthage where the Roman ships could safely provide support and Belisarius could adequately scout the area. Advantage? Check. After drying his feet off in North Africa, Belisarius began moving his force north towards Carthage. Gelimer heard of the landing and was shocked. He executed Hilderic, the pro-Roman guy, and came up with a plan of his own. His brother, Amatis, would march from Carthage to Ad Decimum, the 10th mile marker south of Carthage. There, he would engage Belisarius and prevent him from passing. At the same time, Gelimer's nephew Gibbamund would flank Belisarius from the direction of the salt pans. Finally, 
Gallimer's force, which had been shadowing Belisarius, would flank the Byzantines from behind, enveloping and crushing them. It seemed like a good plan, but relied on Belisarius being quite careless. It also required complex coordination over hundreds of miles, which even for a modern army could be quite difficult to pull off. It was a long shot. Advancing up the coasts, Belisarius obsessively sent scouts to gather intel about his surroundings. He wanted to make sure he knew as much about the area as possible. Advantage? Check. Soon, a scouting party returned with news. They had located Gelimer's army, which had been shadowing them. With this information, Belisarius had his slow-moving infantry set up a fortified encampment a few miles from Ad Decimum. Should Gelimer attack them, they would be safe within their fort and buy Belisarius time to react. As they were building the encampment, a small contingent of around 300 cavalrymen led by John the Arminian and a band of around 600 Hunnic allies a few miles to the west continued to Ad Decimum. As the contingent under John approached Ad Decimum, they encountered Amatus's party, who had left Carthage early. Amatus was not expecting an engagement so soon and his forces were disorganized and moving loosely. John ordered his troops to charge and even though they were egregiously outnumbered, they were able to crush the Vandal force piecemeal because of their disorganized state. Amatus was killed early in the fighting and the rest of the Vandals fled back to Carthage with John giving chase. At almost the exact same time, the Hunnic detachment encountered Gibbamin's flanking force near the salt pans. For one reason or another, the Vandals completely froze. Some say it's because they knew of the Huns' ferocious reputation and panicked, but there's no way to know for sure. Regardless, the Huns charged into the Vandal force which outnumbered them nearly 4 to 1 and made quick work of them. Gibbamind was also killed, making him the second Vandal commander to fall. Soon after, Gelimer's force arrived at Ad Decimum where they engaged a small Roman contingent. The Romans were heavily outnumbered, but they were able to rally back to Belisarius and inform him of the day's events. Much to Gelimer's dismay, it had been obvious an engagement had already occurred here and that Amatus's forces had fled. With the amount of Vandal bodies, Gelimer was under the impression that a much larger force, perhaps even the main Roman army, had been responsible for this and were already on their way to Carthage. Around this time, Gallimer found the body of Amatus and reportedly suffered a severe emotional breakdown. Let's take a moment to reflect on what's happened here. Half of Gallimer's army had already been defeated. Gallimer had completely lost track of Belisarius, and to top it off, he was now an emotional wreck. What a disaster. Not knowing what to do, Gallimer chose to start setting up camp and wait for reinforcements to return from Sardinia. Belisarius, now knowing exactly what had happened, set out for Ad Decima. When they approached, Belisarius ordered a charge at first sight. The disorganized Vandal army stood no chance and routed. Gallimer, with whatever survivors there were, fled inland. The battle was over. The next day, Belisarius marched his army to the city of Carthage where he found the gates wide open. The Roman population was ecstatic at his arrival and welcomed him into the city. Two months later, Gallimer had regrouped his forces and received reinforcements from his brother who had returned from Sardinia. They began marching their army to Carthage. Belisarius, confident and wanting to end the campaign decisively, marched his army out to meet them. They met for battle at Tricamerum, where the Vandals arrayed themselves in a single line. Belisarius tried to coax the Vandals into attacking, but when this didn't work, he ordered a frontal assault. The Roman troops charged, regrouped, and charged again a total of three times until the Vandals broke. They specifically targeted Gelimer's brother, who was given away by his unique armor. By the third charge, he had been killed. Seeing this, Gelimer again suffered an emotional breakdown and fled. Belisarius had won a second decisive battle against the Vandals. A short time later, Gelimer was captured. The campaign was over, and North Africa was brought back into the Roman fold. Belisarius proved to be incredibly popular with both the common soldier and the local population. After Gelimer's capture, some jealous junior commanders wrote to Justinian warning him that Belisarius would proclaim himself king of North Africa. Justinian was skeptical, but decided to test Belisarius anyway. He offered Belisarius to either stay in Carthage as the governor or return to Constantinople for a triumph. Belisarius wisely chose to return to Constantinople.
And so it was that Belisarius, with Gelimer a prisoner, enjoyed one of the last Roman triumphs in recorded history, one that turned out to be well deserved. The North African campaign is the perfect example of what made Belisarius such a great military commander. He had a keen understanding of his own strengths and weaknesses, both strategic and tactical. In addition, he was willing to take decisive actions to magnify his strengths and exploit his enemy's weaknesses. His leadership was dynamic and he was able to capitalize on his opponent's mistakes. His approach to warfare was methodical, and he was not motivated by the pursuit of personal glory. He rarely took actions that were flashy and risky, instead making decisions that would secure the best advantage for his army. He understood the tactical capabilities of each individual unit and how to use them effectively. He knew that information was key and did his best to stay well informed of enemy movements at all times. Lastly, he avoided overextending his forces and opening them up to undue danger. The brilliance of his strategic mind facilitated him stringing together a number of victories and decisively ending the North African campaign. These are characteristics of generalship that have been desirable across all time, and even modern military commanders can find value in studying Belisarius. In 535 CE, the Eastern Roman Empire was coming off a resounding victory against the Vandal Kingdom in North Africa. Emboldened by success, Emperor Justinian was ready to turn his sights to the reconquest of Italy. After all, what is a Roman Empire without Rome? Italy was currently under the control of the Ostrogothic Kingdom. After the barbarian general Odoacer deposed the last Western Emperor in 476, he reportedly sent the imperial regalia to Constantinople, thereby declaring the office of Western Emperor defunct. Eastern Emperor Zeno became wary of Odoacer as he established control over Italy and Dalmatia. In the Balkans, a Gothic chieftain named Theodoric had been causing problems for the East. Zeno sought to end two issues with one swift strike. He promised Theodoric that if he took his army to Italy and got rid of Odoacer, he would be allowed to rule the peninsula in his own right and as the emperor's representative. Theodoric agreed, marched his army to Italy, and won. Ostrogothic rule was established. Unlike the Vandals, the Goths tried to integrate themselves with the native Romans. They were tolerant of the Romans' different brand of Christianity, actively worked with the Roman Senate in matters of governance, and guaranteed the continuity of other Roman institutions. Still, the Goths established themselves as a ruling class, taking on roles of defense and land ownership, while the Romans settled into roles as administrators, farmers, laborers, and more. It was this Gothic political order Justinian hoped to topple. First, like with the Vandals, he needed a casus belli. After a prosperous rule, Theodoric died in 526. His successor was his grandson named Athalaric, who was 10. The boy's mother, Amalasuntha, was the regent and effective ruler of the Ostrogothic kingdom. Amalasuntha led a pro-Roman agenda and sought to have Athalaric educated in the Roman tradition. The Gothic aristocracy disdained being ruled by a woman and feared her influence would turn the young king weak and effeminate. So they did what any group of good men would do and took the boy out to do manly things like binge drinking. Athalaric loved hanging out with these boys, so much so that into his early teens, severe alcoholism was draining the boy's health. At the young age of 17, Athalaric was dead. He had drunk himself to death. Amalasuntha's position was crumbling without her son. Sensing her weakness, Justinian began putting pressure on her to cede territory to the emperor in exchange for safety. Amalasuntha delayed as long as she could, but the pressure was too much. Reluctantly, she turned to her cousin, a man named Theodahad. Because he was family, he had a claim to the throne. Amalasuntha needed to marry him and have him proclaimed king as soon as possible. Their relationship was tense and they had fiery disagreements, but hey, why let a little hatred and personal enmity get in the way of a good marriage? So, the two of them married and Theodahad was proclaimed king. But as soon as the formalities were out of the way, he ordered Amalasuntha arrested. Turns out, hatred and personal enmity are more than enough to get in the way of a good marriage. Drat! Who knew? 
In Constantinople, Justinian was unable to abide the arrest of the pro-Roman Amalasuntha and flew into action. However, while he was in the process of demanding her release, Diadahad ordered her execution. Unwittingly, he had delivered Justinian's casus belli on a silver platter. Justinian's Italian operation had three distinct phases. First, he would apply purely diplomatic pressure in the hopes of securing concessions. If that failed, he would authorize limited military operations along three fronts. First, an incursion into Sicily. Second, an incursion into Dalmatia. And third, bribes would be sent to the Franks to incite an incursion into the north. After a little more saber rattling, the Adahad would hopefully concede more territory, maybe even all of Italy. Finally, if the Goths resisted, Justinian would authorize full-scale military operations into the Italian peninsula. Phase 1 had already ended after Justinian's attempts to pressure Amalasuntha had failed. It was time for Phase 2. Belisarius was appointed to head the Sicilian expedition force, the most important one. He loaded about 8,000 soldiers aboard his ships and set sail. His orders were to stop at Sicily as though they were heading to Carthage and assess the situation. If the island's defenses were too strong, he was to continue sailing. If practicable, he was to take the island. The war began with the Roman incursion into Dalmatia. There, they successfully captured their objective, the city of Salona. Around the same time, Belisarius landed in Sicily. To his pleasant surprise, not only were the Gothic forces scant, but the native population was ready to support his efforts. His forces set out right away, and town after town surrendered as he approached. Only Panormus put up any resistance. Here, Belisarius showed off his famed ingenuity. The city's walls were strong on land, but their sea walls weren't even as tall as the masts on the Roman ships. After fixing platforms to the masts, Belisarius had the ships sail to the harbor with his archers firing down on the defenders. The panicked garrison surrendered shortly after, and Belisarius' conquest of Sicily was swiftly complete. In the north, the Franks had been receptive to Justinian's bribes and were massing their forces on the northern border. Under pressure on three different fronts, the Adahad was ready to capitulate and open negotiations. What a dream come true for Justinian. Before they could formally surrender, the Roman efforts were hit with a double whammy. First, the Goths counterattacked in Dalmatia. They were defeated but killed the Roman general Mundus in the process. The imperial army retreated shortly after to regroup. At nearly the exact same time, a mutiny broke out in North Africa and Carthage was put under siege. Belisarius was forced to leave Sicily and deal with the problem. The rebels broke the siege almost as soon as he arrived and headed inland. Belisarius followed them with only around 2,000 troops. Outnumbered 4 to 1, he met them in a single pitched battle. The mutineers were effectively leaderless, and while haphazardly repositioning to keep the wind out of their faces, Belisarius recognized an opportunity and charged. The rebels scattered. As quickly as possible, Belisarius returned to Sicily. He had bought enough time for somebody else to finish off the rebels. His mission was in Sicily, and his presence there was crucial. The death of Mundus and the African mutiny took pressure off the Goths at a pivotal time. The Adahad now felt confident he could win this war. I can't stress just how close Justinian was here, but the second phase had failed. He appointed a new general to take Dalmatia and authorized Belisarius to conduct full military operations in Italy. Belisarius took most of his army and sailed to southern Italy. Once there, the defenseless southern cities fell with ease. Within just a few months, he had captured Brutium, Lucania, and Campania with no contest. However, his lightning-quick advance would be abruptly stopped as he came across Naples, a city with daunting walls and a strong Gothic garrison. When faced with a siege, the attacker has four options. One, assault the city walls. Two, encircle the city and starve them out. Three, bypass the city. Four, negotiated surrender, which can include bribery and threats. Looking at the small size of his army, 
Belisarius knew there was no attacking the walls. He absolutely could not afford the losses. Starving out the garrison would take time, and the threat of Gothic reinforcements was always around the corner. Bypassing the city would leave their flanks and supply lines vulnerable. He was left with option 4. Belisarius tried to open a dialogue with the Goths, but it was pretty clear to them he was just blowing smoke, and they weren't buying it. Dang. All these options suck. You might be asking, what's left other than to just go home? Well, that's where the oft unexplored fifth option comes in. Trickery. Belisarius ordered his troops to evaluate the city walls for weaknesses. After a couple weeks, one of his surveyors returned with a report. There was an out of commission and unguarded aqueduct that the Romans just might be able to widen enough to fit men through. Under the cover of night, Belisarius ordered his engineers in. They widened the aqueduct, and the next thing you know, the gates of the city were being thrown wide open after hundreds of imperial troops filtered in. As Naples was captured, Belisarius prohibited his men from doing any harm to the Gothic garrison. They were to be prisoners. His clemency here set the precedent that surrender was a viable option for the Goths. If they gave up, their safety was guaranteed. Although, let's not pretend he was doing this out of goodwill. During negotiations, Belisarius issued vague threats to the Neapolitan citizens that, were they to resist, he wouldn't be able to stop his barbarian auxiliary troops from sacking the city. The Neapolitans were about to give up, but at the last second, two Gothic lieutenants convinced them to continue the fight. Once the city was taken, Belisarius lived up to his threats. And as the Hunnic and Harul cavalrymen trampled across the city, thousands of Neapolitan citizens were slaughtered. But before they were, to enact their vengeance, the terrified Neapolitans caught and lynched the two Gothic lieutenants who had convinced them to fight. Yikes. In Rome, Theodahad was on the hot seat. He had done nothing to stop the lightning-quick advance of Belisarius, and the people were angry. After the loss of Naples, enough was enough. The Gothic aristocrats elected a new king, and Theodahad was butchered in the streets as he tried to flee. Theodahad having done nothing, the new Gothic king named Vitiges set out to fight some fires. Belisarius had caused massive problems in the south. The Roman army in the east had recently retaken Dalmatia, and the Franks in the north were still threatening invasion. The first of these threats Vitiges chose to deal with was the Franks. He left a garrison of 4,000 men in Rome and left with the rest of his army northwards after taking most of the Roman Senate hostage. As we will soon learn, choosing not to fight Belisarius during this time was a huge mistake. Shortly after the fall of Naples, the rest of Campania and Apulia surrendered. Belisarius was now ready to march on Rome. After receiving an invitation from the Pope and people of Rome to enter the city, Belisarius marched, leaving a small garrison behind in Naples. The Gothic garrison had absolutely no idea how the people of Rome felt until, to their great surprise, they found the gates of the city being thrown wide open as Belisarius' army arrived outside the walls. As the Romans marched into the city, the Gothic garrison slipped out through the back. Their commander stayed behind in shame to surrender to Belisarius personally. Rome was back in the empire after a bloodless capture. At this point, Belisarius decided he could no longer safely conduct offensive operations. After leaving garrisons, he was left with about 5,000 men. Continuing northward would leave him dangerously overextended. Rather, this was the perfect time for him to switch to a defensive posture. If the Goths wanted in, they would have to grind themselves down in a siege. To prepare, Belisarius shored up the city's defenses by digging a moat around the 12-mile-long circuit of walls and repairing any damaged areas of the 52-foot-high defenses. He stockpiled his provisions and sent small garrisons to occupy the undefended walled cities of Narnia, Spoletum, and Perugia. Doing so gave him control over the most direct route to Rome, and would force Vitiges to either grind his army down taking the walled cities, or use a longer, more circuitous route for his supply trains. Vitiges was going to fight on Belisarius' terms. After striking a deal with the Franks, Vitiges headed south. As he arrived in the area, he chose to bypass the forts and headed straight to Rome. Before we get into it, we need to address something. Our main source here is the personal chronicler of Belisarius, a guy named Procopius. While much of his accounts seem well within reason, there are portions that are clearly embellishment. 
For example, Procopius claims Vitiges arrived with a force of 150,000 men. This is almost certainly not true. If it were, Vitiges would have had no problem fully encircling the city of Rome. In reality, he didn't even try. More convincing estimates are within the ballpark of 25 to 35,000. Still a strong advantage. The Siege of Rome is also full of stories of the personal bravery and heroism of Belisarius. We're gonna get into these because they're good fun, but please do take them with a little grain of salt. Upon arrival, Vitiges came across a Roman sentry post set up at the Milvian Bridge. When they saw what was coming, the Roman sentries immediately deserted. Belisarius and a thousand of his elite cavalry were riding out to do a routine checkup on the sentries. To their great shock, the area was swarming with Goths. They fought tooth and nail to get to the outpost, with Belisarius fighting personally in the front lines. Once they learned of the sentry's desertion, they disengaged and rode back to the walls of Rome. There, the wall guards refused to open the gates, thinking it was a Gothic trick. It wasn't until Belisarius and his troops charged into a nearby group of Goths that the soldiers were convinced. Back inside, instead of punishment, Belisarius commended the guards for their caution. The Goths set up fortified encampments at seven locations. Six were on the east side of the Tiber, between the Flaminian and Praenestine gates. The seventh was on the Vatican Plains on the west side, meant to secure the strategically important Milvian Bridge. The Goths' first move was to cut the aqueducts, bringing water into the city. These lines were not used for drinking water, but to operate the city's grain mills. Without them, Rome would starve. Belisarius acted quickly by fixing wheels between two boats and using the force of the Tiber to grind the grain. The Goths sent logs and other debris down the river to destroy the mills, but Belisarius hung a chain across the Tiber which caught the debris. Dozens more boat mills were set up following this ingenious approach. On the 18th day, Vitiges launched his big assault. When Belisarius looked over the walls to see what they were doing, he loudly laughed. His soldiers were confused by this laughter, verging on angry, but when Belisarius pointed out their battering rams and siege towers were being pulled by exposed oxen, it all made sense. After personally felling three Goths with as many shots of the bow, Belisarius ordered his archers to target the oxen and men pulling the engines into place, rendering them useless. After, he ordered a sally to destroy the siege engines along with any lingering Goths. Elsewhere, the Goths made more progress, but were always defeated. Over at the Vivarium Gate, the Goths had been digging a mine to destroy a section of the walls underneath. Not knowing what to do, the men called for Belisarius. When he arrived, he calmly devised a plan to build fortifications around the area the Goths were destroying. Later in the day, the section of walls crumbled. When the Goths emerged from the breach, all they found was another wall and a flurry of arrows. They fell back, chased out by the Romans at every step of the way. Frustrated by the failure of his big assault, Vitiges ordered the murders of the senators he had earlier taken hostage. This was getting ugly. Vitiges' aim was now to constrain the Byzantine supply as much as possible. He sent a force to capture Portus, the main harbor that was supplying Rome. The Romans now had to use the ports of Ostia and Antium and transport the supplies over land, limiting the provisions they could bring in. At the same time, Belisarius began to lead a very active defense. He relocated the women and children of Rome to Naples in order to alleviate his supply issues, and conscripted all able-bodied Roman men to fight in the garrison. After, with his professional horse archers, he engaged the enemy in hit-and-run tactics. He sent his cavalry to occupy nearby high ground, hail the enemy with arrows, and only retreat when they either ran out of arrows or when their way back was threatened. The Gothic cavalry was only trained to use spears and swords. Every time they charged, the Roman cavalry would simply reposition, then keep firing. These tactics proved extremely effective, and the Goths had absolutely no answer. The success of these skirmishes brought confidence. Belisarius was suddenly under pressure from his troops to go out and battle the Goths. Eventually, he gave in and started drawing up plans. Initially, he planned to engage with cavalry only, using his weaker, unprofessional infantry as rally points near the walls. His infantry commanders argued fiercely, trying to get in on the action. Eventually, Belisarius was convinced after two of his lieutenants promised the infantry would not break they would fight. He sent a portion of his cavalry and infantry to pin down the Goths on the west side of the Tiber, whilst the rest of the army would attack the camps on the east. The troops marched out and met in battle. At first, things were going really well. 
but when the cavalry on the right tried to regroup behind the infantry, panic spread and most of the infantry immediately began to rout. Seizing the opportunity, the Goths on the right wheeled and routed the rest of the Roman army. The day would have been a complete disaster, but a contingent of the infantry, led by the two lieutenants, put up a last stand and allowed the army to escape. They both paid with their lives. Belisarius reverted to his hit-and-run tactics for the rest of the year to great effect. As winter came and went, scouts reported to Belisarius that the Goths were barely conducting patrols or even leaving their camps at night. It appeared their morale was very low. The Roman navy was preventing the Goths from importing food by sea, and the Roman control of the Via Flaminia was putting lots of pressure on their supply lines. Belisarius sent out detachments to occupy small forts and attack Gothic forging parties, putting even more pressure on their supply situation. Pretty soon, famine and disease broke out in the Gothic camps. The besiegers had become the besieged. Later, Belisarius received words that reinforcements had arrived in Italy. To keep them from being attacked on their way in, he launched a daring attack on one of the Gothic camps. A force was sent from the Pincian Gate to distract the Gothic camp near the Via Flaminia. As they began to pursue the Romans, another force was sent from the Flaminian Gate, which the Goths had previously thought to have been blocked off. The two Roman units crashed into the Goths, encircling and destroying them. While they were licking their wounds, the Roman reinforcements were able to enter the city. Seeking some respite, Vitiges sought and received a three-month truce to discuss peace terms in Constantinople. Belisarius used this time to improve his position. The Goths had been forced to abandon Portus and some surrounding areas due to attrition. Belisarius sent troops to occupy the areas. Next, a commander named John was sent with a force of 2,000 cavalry behind enemy lines. His mission was to encamp near Picanum and be ready to take the region when the truce ended. The Goths were caught completely off guard by the Romans' ability to conduct offensive operations after the grueling year-long siege. Under pressure, Vitiges decided to break the truce. He sent men to inspect the aqueducts of Rome, like Belisarius had done in Naples. Feeling like he could repeat the brilliant move, he sent engineers to open one of them up, but they were caught in the act. With this, Belisarius authorized John to take Picanum, which he swiftly did. John then exceeded his orders, and went on. And went on. And went on. All the way to the city of Ariminum, who threw open their gates for him. Ariminum was just a day's march from the Gothic capital of Ravenna. Now feeling severely threatened, Vitiges felt he had no option but to break the siege of Rome. Belisarius had won. As the Goths were retreating across the Milvian Bridge, he ordered one last sortie across the Vatican Plains, cutting down any Goth who had failed to cross. It was a resounding victory. As Army Major Anthony Brogna states, quote, the defense of Rome was a part of an integrated campaign plan to reduce the Goths' numbers and fighting spirit, end quote. Before, conducting further offensive operations would have been extremely dangerous, but after, Belisarius was more or less free to continue his conquest of Italy. His switch from a strategic offensive posture to a tactical defensive one came at the perfect time. While the battle outside the walls of Rome was certainly a miscalculation, the rest of the siege had been handled brilliantly. Throughout the entire siege, Belisarius kept constant pressure on the Goths, both actively with skirmishing and passively by creating supply constraints. Just as with his African campaign, he was able to identify the units that held the greatest advantages over the Goths and deploy them not only to incredible success, but in a way that Goths couldn't even hope to contend with. His active scouting and communications expertise led him to being constantly informed of the enemy's situation and where they were moving. His deployment of John, among many other examples, again portrays a keen eye for opportunities and both the initiative and courage to act on them. Okay, so quick recap. The Eastern Roman Empire was invading Italy against the Ostrogothic Kingdom, which dominated the peninsula after the fall of the Western Empire. This was all part of Emperor Justinian's big plan to re-establish Roman rule in the West. 
Belisarius was the general in charge of leading the expedition, and right now, he was chilling in Rome. He had captured most of southern Italy in the first months of the war and had successfully defended the city of Rome in a year-long siege against the Ostrogothic king, a guy named Vitiges. This was all a part of Belisarius' brilliant campaign plan, and he had totally outclassed the Goths at almost every turn. Now, with the Goths defeated and retreating from Rome, it was once again time for Belisarius to go on the offensive. Just because the Goths were defeated didn't mean they were out of the fight. Belisarius knew this thing was going to take time, patience, skill, and a little bit of luck. The Gothic army was currently heading northward toward Ariminum. Recently, Belisarius had sent a sub-commander named John behind enemy lines with a large contingent of cavalry to harass and put pressure on the Goths. John did so, at first, but over the following days he exceeded his orders and marched all the way to Ariminum, which was only a short ways down the road from the Gothic capital of Ravenna. John occupied the city, but now there were tens of thousands of angry Goths on their way to get him out. This was terrible. Roman forces were overextended, and Belisarius knew there was no way John's small force could hold out in a siege. They needed to get out of there ASAP. Since the Romans controlled the Via Flaminia, the Goths were forced to take the scenic route. Because of this, Belisarius was able to get messengers to John, ordering him to abandon the city and link up with the rest of the army. Only days later, the messengers returned without John. He had said no. Wait, he said no? What? Why would he do something so silly? Belisarius was perplexed by John's insubordination. It's not clear why John disobeyed this order, but it is clear the two men had a deeply strained relationship. It's possible John had a strategic disagreement, but it's also possible he simply didn't like Belisarius and wanted to elevate his own standing in the Roman government. Regardless, with John refusing to leave Ariminum, there was nothing Belisarius could do about the situation. As the Gothic army arrived, they set up a siege and cut the city's food supplies. Now, Belisarius had decisions to make. Around this time, a Roman general named Narses arrived in Italy with a force of around 7,000 men. After taking a couple smaller cities near Rome, Belisarius took most of his army to meet up with Narses, where the two could discuss the John situation. Narses was a personal friend and ally of John. He advocated for a direct approach, marching to Ariminum and breaking the siege. The cautious Belisarius protested, arguing they should first clear out some of the walled cities along the way. The Goths had failed to clear out the cities the Byzantines held along the way to Rome and were punished for it. Belisarius did not want to repeat their mistake. Narses respected his caution but continued to argue that time was of the essence and taking the walled cities would take too long. They had reached an impasse. The arguing continued until finally time had run out. A message had been received from John, which effectively said, Hey guys, just letting you know, I only have seven days of food left. If you don't get me out of here by then, I'm giving up. What a dork. Obviously, Belisarius couldn't let that happen, so he marched northwards with the rest of the army, bypassing the walled cities. To get the gods away from Ariminum, Belisarius came up with a brilliant plan. Scare them off. How? By making a massive, massive display of military force. One problem, they didn't actually have a massive, massive military force. To Belisarius, this was no more than a minor inconvenience. He split his army into two groups, which would simultaneously advance along two roads, one coastal and one inland. At the same time, the Roman navy would sail up the Adriatic towards Ariminum. At night, when the armies encamped, they lit dozens of extra campfires to exaggerate the size of their army. The Goths first encountered the inland force led by Belisarius. Thinking this was the whole Roman army, they prepared for battle. That evening, Gothic scouts sighted another massive Roman army approaching from the coast. Now things were getting concerning. When they woke the next morning to find the Roman fleet had appeared outside the city, panic struck, and the Goths made a hasty retreat to Ravenna. Belisarius pulled off a flawless victory in which the enemy abandoned their objective at the cost of no lives. Successful in pitched battles and sieges, Belisarius was now accomplished in psychological warfare as well.
John was reunited with Narses and Belisarius, and the internal divisions began to kick into overdrive. For starters, John refused to acknowledge Belisarius' role in his saving, only extending his thanks to Narses, to whom John owed his whole career. Next, he began openly questioning Belisarius' role as the supreme commander, instead advocating for Narses to take over. Later, in a strategy meeting, Narses and John again became insubordinate, dismissing Belisarius' plan to capture the towns they had left behind and declaring that they would be taking their army to attack the Goths in Amelia, no matter what Belisarius chose to do with his army. Frustrated by all this malarkey, a tense argument broke out. Accusing the two officers of insubordination, Belisarius pulled the seniority card and brought out his letter of appointment from Justinian. With it, he declared the decision was his, and only his, to make. Narses, however, was a cunning politician and argued that the verbiage of the letter was too unclear. It only gave Belisarius command of, again, his army. Narses and John were free to do as they wished with their army. Unable to assert his authority and unable to reach an agreement, the generals split and went in different directions. Belisarius took his force south and set up sieges at Irvaventus and Urbinus. Meanwhile, from Ariminum, Narses ridiculed Belisarius, decrying his actions as pointless folly as he ordered John to attack Caesena. Narses' criticism wasn't necessarily without merit. As they began to encircle the city, it was looking like these sieges were going to take some time. But only a short while later, Belisarius caught a lucky break when the water supply of Urbinus failed and the city was forced to surrender. Not long after, Irvaventus surrendered in suit. Narses ate his words. Around this time, the Goths had amassed a huge army and were besieging the town of Milan. Wait, Milan? Where do they factor into this? Well, during the siege of Rome, Belisarius received envoys from Milan who invited his army to take control of the city as soon as possible. When he got the chance, Belisarius sent a force of 1,000 men to garrison Milan's walls. Now, they were in dire straits. Reinforcements had already been sent, but they were stuck trying to cross the Po River in some bad weather. Only John's army was nearby in any position to help. Urgently, Belisarius sent messengers ordering John to rush to their aid. But as before, he simply refused to follow Belisarius' orders. Perplexed again by John's horrible decision making, Belisarius began writing to Narses, pleading with him to order John to Milan's aid. Narses agreed to do so, and after wasting several critical days, John set out for Milan. Shortly after, reports came in that John was no longer needed, for there was no more Milan. The garrison of Milan had struck a deal with the Goths. In exchange for their lives, they gave up the city. Note the verbiage. The Goths agreed to spare the lives of the garrison. Only the garrison. In retribution for their defiance, the city of Milan was razed to the ground. Tens of thousands of Milanese citizens were slaughtered or dragged off into slavery. The Gothic army then marched to the other side of the Po from the Roman reinforcements, leading to a tense standoff. John's delay had cost the Romans dearly. What a disaster. Belisarius was infuriated. He wrote a scathing letter to Justinian, blaming John and Narses for the fall of Milan and demanding clarification on who was in charge. Justinian wrote back, this time in crystal clear language, Belisarius is and was always the senior commander, no exceptions. With consideration to his insubordination, Narses was recalled to Constantinople. In my opinion, Belisarius acted way too late here. At the first sign of trouble, he should have written Justinian. Instead, Narses and John were able to dither about, eschewing the chain of command for weeks, and it ended up costing the lives of thousands. Belisarius' inability to control his junior commanders had seriously damaged the war effort. Nevertheless, the campaign continued. As spring came and went, famine began to ravage the Italian peninsula because of the mass devastation to the region. Since the Romans could import their supplies, they had an easier time, but the Goths were feeling it. Belisarius, now in full control of the 11,000-man army, set up a siege at Oximus, 
The city had requested help from Vitiges multiple times, but the Gothic king could not move due to supply issues. Seeking any kind of assistance, Vitiges sent diplomatic missions to the Sassanid Empire, hoping to prompt an invasion on Justinian's eastern border. Justinian's web of spies learned of the Gothic diplomats and they informed Justinian to the emperor's great alarm. The entire concept of Justinian's wars was predicated on peace with Persia. Fighting on two fronts was not an option. He wrote to Khosrow trying to soothe his ego, but to no luck. Predicting the worst, he knew it was time to wrap things up in Italy. Meanwhile, Belisarius had quickly taken over the last couple cities on the way to Ravenna. No longer overextended, he was free to march on the Gothic capital. They arrived outside the walls of Ravenna in late 539. Vitiges tried to open negotiations for surrender, feeling the hopelessness of his situation. Belisarius entertained this, but sent contingents to secure Venetia and the Cadian Alps during negotiations. Most of Italy was now under Roman control. After over four years of hard work, only Ravenna remained. As winter came, a new directive arrived from Constantinople. Justinian was offering peace. The Romans were to annex all of Italy up to the Po River, and everything north would be the Goths' domain. Vitiges felt obliged to sign the treaty, but when it arrived in Belisarius' camp for his signature, the famed general refused to sign. Infuriated, Belisarius would not give up when total victory was so close. He had spent almost five years working towards this end, and now he was being asked to leave his project incomplete? Outrageous. With the future of the Gothic aristocracy now uncertain, they devised a new plan. They would simply offer Belisarius the title Emperor of the West. Under this plan, even Vitiges lent his full support. If Belisarius accepted, the war was finished. There was no way Justinian could muster another force large enough to invade Italy again. The Goths also knew Belisarius to be an honorable man who would make a great ruler. Surely he would accept, right? Well, not so fast. The honorable Belisarius saw a chance to manipulate the Goths. He agreed to the offer nominally, but stipulated the coronation must be done in front of Vitiges inside Ravenna. The Goths went along with this, and after going through all the motions, Belisarius and the Roman army were allowed inside the gates of Ravenna. Once there, Belisarius ordered the Gothic treasury moved to Constantinople. He had taken this city for the empire. The Goths had been tricked. They were completely shocked. It was now midsummer of 540, and the victorious Belisarius was now leaving Italy for Persia. While the bloodless capture of Ravenna was an act of military brilliance, it turned out to be a horrible miscalculation. In refusing to sign the peace treaty, he had not only directly disobeyed Justinian, but undermined the emperor's authority. Coupled with the fact the title Emperor of the West had been thrown around with Belisarius' name on it, any trust Justinian had in his best general was gone. Their relationship was horribly damaged. His betrayal fomented further rebellion among the Goths. They had been content to let him rule, and most of them were on the way to Ravenna to capitulate. When they heard of his betrayal, they were outraged. Mere months after he left, the Goths enjoyed a resurgence under a new energetic king, Tatila. What should have been an easy mop-up job for the occupying Roman forces became a rout as Tatila's forces swept south. When Belisarius was forced to return to Italy, he would never get the resources he needed to truly win due to his strained relationship with Justinian. Not only that, Justinian was hesitant to give any of his generals the resources they needed due to the fears in his mind that were largely validated by Belisarius. Lastly, the general's presence was badly needed in the east. The Persian threat was serious, and in the couple months it took for him to secure Ravenna, the Persians had already declared war. With little standing in Khosrow's way, the Persian army was able to freely march across Syria and plunder huge amounts of gold. Belisarius' insubordination had cost the empire dearly in several ways. While there were plenty of brilliant moments in the Italian campaign that give it the appearance of success, it was ultimately a failure. In a couple years, the Romans would have to run the whole thing back. Belisarius' role in this failure was blatant. As a general, a crucial trait he clearly lacked was the ability to command loyalty among subordinates, which may well be the most important trait a general can have. 
What good is anything else if you can't control your subcommanders? How can you effectively lead if you're constantly losing the initiative to internal army politics? Had he been able to exert his authority in a timelier manner? Perhaps the campaign could have been ended sooner and to much better results. As of now, our coverage of the generalship of Belisarius has come to an end. While there's more campaigning to do and Belisarius would continue to play a role, the defining event over the next few years would become the arrival of the bubonic plague. Its effects across all aspects of society were immense, and in understanding these campaigns, it's crucial to also understand the plague. Fortunately, you don't have to go too far. I've already covered the plague in great detail, so go check it out. Finally, lots of you guys have messaged me asking for a face reveal. Enough of these requests have been coming in that I figured, what the heck, it's about time. So, here we go. Yes, this is me. Here I am. I am the one who pulls the levers of animation. The proverbial man behind the curtain. I can already hear some of you asking, Hey man, what's with the weird clothes? Well, soon enough, I'm going to be taking you on a journey to medieval England. We'll be immersed in a story of spite and revenge, a tale of mischief, murder, and mayhem, a true Game of Thrones. So, join me in the not too distant future as we explore the Wars of the Roses. Until then, catch me on Patreon where in exchange for helping a small content creator keep the lights on, you'll find additional content, updates, early access to videos, and more. All for as little as $3 a month. Wow. Less than a cappuccino. What a deal. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I will see you in England.